Residential rents vary across the province, but what's the same from here to Thunder Bay and back is that rents are going up. And for some tenants, facing rent hikes above the provincial guidelines, they've decided it's too much. They've begun what's called a rent strike. And just as the name suggests, it means they're not paying for the roof over their head until they see the changes they want. How do such actions work? And do they work? Let's find out. We're going to ask Varun Sriskanda, board member at the Small Ownership Landlords of Ontario, Kiara Padavani, co-chair and founder of the York Southwestern Tenant Union, Kayla Andrade, president of Ontario Landlords Watch, and Ricardo Tranjan, senior researcher with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives and the author of The Tenant Class, a picture of which we are seeing right now with a lovely apartment building on the cover. Uh, good to welcome everybody here to TVO tonight for this conversation. Ricardo, start us off. A rent strike is exactly what? In a rent strike, uh, organized tenors, tenants decide to withhold rent to force the, negotiation, the landlord to come to the negotiation table. Their demands are usually around um, rent increases, repairs, or evictions. Um, in some ways, rent strikes are very similar to labor strikes in that business owners have capital assets that generate revenue. The strategy of a strike is to stop the flow of revenue. You call the attention of the business owner and you provide them some incentive or some pressure to come to the negotiation table and to try and come to an agreement as soon as possible because they want revenue to resume. Okay, Kayla, rent strikes, or I should say labor strikes, when the contract is over and you've got your mandate to do so, are legal. Are rent strikes legal? Definitely not. When a rent strike happens, it goes on the concept that a tenant is going to withhold a rent, and the only way for you to withhold your rent is to, um, as if the landlord didn't give you your lease at the beginning of your lease, and then you can hold a one month's rent. Besides that, it's not legal, and what it's going to do is just put tenants in a harm way of being potentially evicted. Kiara, what's the goal of the rent strike? At the end of the day, you do it because you want what? Well, I'm here uh, as co-chair of the York Southwest and Tenant Union, and one of our member tenant associations, 33 King Street, uh, has made the decision to go on a rent strike by withholding their rent, like Ricardo said, until a negotiated settlement can happen with the landlord against something called above guideline rent increases. Uh, these are tactics that landlords use, especially large corporate landlords, to get around following rent control. Uh, the position of the Tenant Association and the 33 King Tenant, um, York Southwest and Tenant Union is that landlords have to pay to maintain their building. It's, it's what they receive rent for. So keeping their, their building in a good state of rep repair is what tenants are paying. It's actually literally what landlords get paid to do. It's their side of the agreement. Um, and when they're passing on these costs, in the case of 33 King Street, Rents have gone up three times higher than rent control in the last five years. Even during the pandemic in 2021, when there was supposed to be a rent freeze where other landlords were not allowed to increase rents, Dream Unlimited, which is the landlord and owner of 33 King Street, still increased rents 3% um, for tenants in 33 King. 33 King is a building in well, the northwest part of Toronto? In Weston. Weston, okay, got it. How much are landlords allowed to increase rents this year? So this year, a landlord is capped at increasing it by 2.5%. Um, that isn't enough. That's not enough to keep up with maintenance. That's not enough to keep up with the mortgage, the property taxes, the insurance. If you look at the city of Toronto, we increased property taxes, I believe, more than 2.5. I believe it's 2.9 this year. That's, uh, so already property owners are having to deal with more expenses that they can't handle. Now, when you have all these expenses, you're unable to address the really important stuff, which is critical maintenance issues, addressing tenants' maintenance concerns and upgrading the critical infrastructure of some of these aging buildings in Toronto. Who decided it can only be 2.5%? Mm -hmm. That was decided by the province, and it's uh, far too low. They need to take into account all the expenses on landlords. Look at the interest rates and the amount it costs to carry a rental property in Ontario. 2.5% hmm. doesn't make the cut. Well, and inflation's running over 5% right now. It is, now, over 5 6 yes. or 7 at one yeah. point over the last couple of years. So uh, what falls behind when you can only raise the... I should go to you on this then. Uh, Kayla, 
What falls behind when you only get two and a half percent rent increase, but you actually need five, six, seven, whatever? Your housing stock, that falls behind. If you look at 2.5% increase of what the landlords are allowed, and we can say that the rents have skyrocketed in the cities, but they're not the units that are underneath the rent, rent control. This is for the turnover of units that are within our, our province that are doing turnover. A lot of the properties that are aging population at 2.5%, that is going to be, all of this rent strike movement, that's coming from, a this is a symptom of the rent controls. It's catching up with our economy, and that's why we're seeing a decrease in the small landlords who are 70% of the housing stock getting out of this business. And that's why it's ex extremely important to make sure that we understand it as a business and the numbers need to make sense. And the government has controlled this industry so long that it's causing landlords and tenants to fight each other. And instead, the tenants and the landlords need to come to the table together, contact Steve Clark, Doug Downey, every layer of our so issues. Two cabinet ministers that you've just referenced there. Okay, Ricardo, where, do, where are you coming down on this? I'm coming down looking at data on an aggregate level because you can't have it both ways. You cannot say that rents are skyrocketing and, you can, and, and the same sentence say that rents are not going up enough, that they're only going up by 2.5%. So when we take a step back and we look at CMHC data, you see that year over year, average rents go above go up by way above the rent guideline. And that's for a number of reasons, because you have the loophole, you have the above guideline rent increase. It's because between tenancies, landlords increase rents on average by 28% in Toronto. Uh, it's because year of- Year over year? No, between tenancies. Between tenancies, I Between see. tenancies, okay. there's no vacancy controls in Toronto. There's vacancy decontrol, so they can catch up. So in a building, there's always a turnover, which sometimes is around 10 to 12 percent. So for that, you, those units in the building, the rents are actually going up by way more. So we have to think in terms of averages, and the average is much higher than the rent guideline increases. And so when you look at that way, you can tell that um, it is not a fact that landlords are constrained by the guideline rent increases they are increasing rents by way more. Well, let me pursue that because, okay, the guideline is 2.5%, but as you point out, you can apply to go above the guideline if you can demonstrate that you have just cause for doing so. Mm -hmm. so what is the maximum above the guideline that you can get? You can get up to 3% three years in a row. So that will add to 9% over three years, compound on top of whichever number you got for the guideline. Okay, right? Varun, is that, uh, I mean, th three is higher than two and a half. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot higher than two and a half, so does that go any distance to allowing you to do what you need to do? No, absolutely not. Not when inflation's at 5.5, it's running close to seven. We need much higher than that. We need a rent increase of at least 5.5%. That's the only way small landlords are going to be able to continue to make ends meet. Most small landlords and most of the members at Solo, they're not cash flow positive. Solo it, is the Small name of ownership favorite. landlords of Ontario. We, most of the members there are not cash flow positive on their rentals. If they were to take uh, their units out of Ontario's rental housing stock, it would seriously drive up the cost of renting in this province. Now, between tenancies, we do increase the cost of the rental unit back to market rate. Now, if we want that market rate to go lower, it's simple rule, supply and demand. We need to increase the supply. There is no one else. The government isn't doing their job in increasing the supply of purpose-built rentals. They don't incentivize developers to build apartment buildings. They say it's actually been higher in the past year than it has in the past 10. Yes, but that's the, we're catching up for the mistakes that we've been making the last decade. We've been seriously slacking. We built a ton of PBRs, purpose-built rentals, in the 60s and in the 70s. And those are the aging buildings that we are currently trying to maintain and keep up with. Kiara, let me get the 411 on your rent strike. First of all, when did it start? It started on June 1st. Did everybody do it? We had half of the building commit to doing it. That's 200 tenants to be going on a rent strike on June 1st. And there's a few things I'd like to respond to. Um, we talk about running a business. In the case of 33 King Street, the landlord dream has 50% of the income they collect from rents is profit. 50% of the income they're collecting from tenants at 33 King Street is profit. How do you know that? It was in their latest financial statements, okay. something that they shared publicly with, their, with the public. So 
when when Dream Unlimited turns around and says, you know, cries poor or says these are necessary repairs, our position is you have been collecting 50% profit of rent. Any good business person would know to set some of that aside to make sure that you are providing a housing um, accommodations that are safe and well maintained. Mm -hmm. It's actually the very basis of the other side of the agreement. A, land, uh, a landlord agrees to providing a safe place for people to live, and tenants agree to pay their rent. So half the tenants who are not paying their rent, who are on the rent strike right now, what's their situation? You plan to just keep doing this as long as it takes, or what? Well, I know that some people will try to paint tenants who are withholding rent as part of a collective protest in a rent strike as, um, you know, freeloaders or criminals or breaking the law. What this is about, it's not about free rent. Every tenant on rent strike at 33 King is prepared to pay their rent when the rent strike is over. It's not about free rent. It's not about handouts. It's not about charity. What is it it's about? It's about fairness. And at 33 King Street, rents have gone up three times higher than rent control. According to rent control, in the last five years, rent should have gone up no more than 7%. Tenants at 33 King Street have seen rent increases of 22% for existing tenants, not in between tenancies, for existing tenants. And these are tenants who are the working class of our city. They are keeping our city running. You know, tenants who are personal support workers, who are nurses, who are teachers, early educators, these are people who are really, really working hard. They are decent, hardworking people, but they will not take be taken advantage of. Okay, we have, we should put this on the record here because Dream Unlimited, which owns your building, mm -hmm. uh, sent us this statement of what's going on at 33 King in the northwest part of Toronto, and here is what they've had to say. Since we acquired this property in late 2021, we've been working hard on resolving the prior owner's above guideline rent increases, or AGI applications as they're called, for work completed in 2016 to 2018. We came to a solution on the prior owner's 2018 AGI application, which included a significant reduction from the original ask. Balcony restoration, as well as new window and balcony door installation is critically necessary for the safety of our residents given the age of the building. We have made numerous efforts to meet with tenants one-on-one -on -one to develop individual payment plans as we understand the challenges that come with rent increases. To date, only 24 out of 239 residents have requested assistance. Your response, Kiara. My response to that is, once again, Dream Unlimited is collecting 50% profit from tenants. And whether or not they, when they acquired these, the building, um, it is up to Dream. Dream has the power to say, we are going to follow rent control. We are going to follow the guideline and actually invest some of our profits into maintaining a safe place for tenants to live in. But, but, uh, okay, but speak to the math here. The 24 out of 239 have requested assistance with paying the rent. 24 is a long way from half the residents. So why are half the residents on a rent strike when, a period, when it seems only 24 need some help? Half the residents on a rent strike are, are not asking for charity. They're not asking for favors. They're not asking for handouts from the landlord. They're asking for fairness. They're asking for rent increases that are in line with rent control. This is not about a free handout. This is about having a place where you can live and expect that rents are going to go up at a reasonable amount every year. That your landlord won't try to excessively increase rents every year by getting around rent control and applying for these above guideline rent increases, which is what Dream has done. And in fact, it's what Dream has done more than any other building in the city of Toronto. Okay. Kaylee, you've heard about this? Yeah, What's your response? Like, I'm, I'm trying to just wrap, like, based on a tenant strike, and you want maintenance, and you also want low rent. And the landlords are looking at high interest rates. They are looking at you. It's been across the, the board on high interest rates. And then you have your maintenance, your contractors, your lack of, uh, of being able to get building supplies. So you want more for less. So as landlords are here trying to provide to the economy and trying to build up supply, you're wanting to have low rent and you're saying, I'm not going to give you money in order to do that. And obviously, from what I can see from Dream, they're trying to keep up because they have bylaws and standards that they have to do as the city's requirements. And 
and they need to do that. So as landlords are trying to look at it as a business and they shouldn't be taking their profits because that profit, they need to take that and they need to put it into another bank. They need to put in more private investors. They need to keep building more units. And if you can see tenants doing a rent strike, the only people it's going to hurt is the tenants, the tenants because you're going to be able to yeah, report that to the credit bureaus. Can I just understand, Varun, uh, let's look more broadly, not just at this one circumstance here, but if tenants go on a rent strike, if they refuse to pay their rents uh, for what they see as perfectly legitimate reasons, but which you have already said is illegal, uh, somewhere from illegal to not cool. Uh, what, what tools do you have at your disposal as a landlord to deal with that? Um, immediately, if a tenant stops paying rent, we're going to be serving an N4 notice for non-payment of rent. Um, uh, it's a standard a landlord and tenant board form that indicates a tenant owes uh, X amount in dollars, in rent dollars, and that amount is owed in 14 days. And if we don't receive that rent in 14 days, we will proceed to file for eviction at the landlord and tenant board. Along with that, we will report the tenant's non-payment of rent to Equifax and TransUnion, which impacts their credit score. And along with that, of course, is if the tenant chooses to move out, they have now severely impacted their ability to secure future rent market rate rentals. Now, this is something the tenant unions do not educate tenants on. They are not telling them, please be advised, if this happens and you withhold your rent, you can be evicted. Your Equifax credit score can be impacted. Your landlord will likely not provide you a reference letter saying you were a phenomenal tenant. How then will you secure future rentals if you are evicted for non-payment? Ricardo. I have two points. One is a clarification point earlier. AGIs are applied on top of the guideline increase. So that is 2.5% plus, plus 3%. 3%. So you get your 5.5% three years in a row, when you calculate the compound, that Only is 17 per, that's 17%, and that's more than inflation, and that's more than wage increases. Exactly. So that's one important Only point. If it's an the second point I want to make is about the fact that we overemphasize how much small landlords characterize the, the rental market today. They are a share of the rental market, and they are a share for which we have very little actual data. They are crying poor all the time, and yet we do not have access to their finances. We do not know what is a lot of profit for them, what's enough profit for them, where the buck stops. And you don't know because? Because the data is not available. I got a call once from the president of one of the largest REITs in the country. It was a really good call. We were for an hour just having a good conversation, trying to understand each other's argument. You just used a term I want to make sure people understand, a REIT, Real Estate Income Trust. It's a Real Estate Investment Trust. Investment it's trust. some of the largest landlords in the country. Yeah. And Give me a call, we we're having a really good conversation and trying to understand, genuinely understand each other's argument. And then at some point he asked, Ricardo, why do you and Martin August and all of those other researchers in your camp pick on us? Why are they always coming after us? And by now we're talking for, you know, 45 minutes. We're practically friends. I felt the need to be honest with the guy. And I said, well, in part because your finances are really open. We can go on the internet and we can actually look your financial statements in detail. And when we look at it, we see that your margin profits are really high. As Kiara mentioned, Dream Impact, more than 50% of the rent revenue is net profit, right? So with small landlords, we have no data. They cry poor, they cry poor, they cry poor, and we don't know if they're saying, well, they're saying it's representative or not. And I, there's two I, quick I, problems with that. If I, you allow me, there's two quick problems uh, for them. I do, <laughs> historic, I do historical research, and I can tell you, I can pick any year, any year, and I will find a news article where a small landlord is arguing that they're having the hardest time than any other business. And we do have a little bit of data on Canada industry stat statistics. And you go there, you get small residential landlords that have a gross revenue under $5 million. And then you can compare. You can compare business that went under, margins of profit, total revenue, and small and lords are average. I looked at the data over and over and over. I thought about writing it, but it was so Let's boring that I did. What, what, okay. what data for small landlords? I can show you the data of a single mom who decided to lease out her basement apartment and is now stuck with 30K in data. Areas. This is policy. We it, need it's hard to get data. aggregate data tell. for every... Not here, tell. Not here, tell. Sorry, let, let, let him respond. It's hard to get aggregate data for every single individual small landlord. If a small landlords own most of the most of us, including me and many of my friends, we own one to two rental units. One. 
just one. And many of us just rent out a unit within our primary residence. So we rent out a basement apartment, right? What, what data do you need from a family of four who have decided to lease out their basement apartment so they can help uh, meet mortgage payments, so that they can help save for the future, so that they can refinance and buy another rental property, so that they can refinance and help buy a condominium for their daughter to go to school at University of Toronto? The, the, the small landlords are being piled into corp and mixed up with corporate landlords, and are, we are not the enemy. I don't yeah. think any landlord is the enemy. I think it is um, important, once again, to illustrate that the rent strike happening at 33 King Street and the rent strikes happening in Thorncliff, um, because this isn't the only rent strike against above guideline rent increases that are happening right now, these are against very large corporate landlords. And I'd like to respond to a point that uh, Kayla made earlier. Tenants are not asking to pay less for more. In fact, it's the complete opposite. Over the last year, tenants at 33 King have been paying more for less. Because of the construction, they haven't had access to their balconies, they haven't had access to common amenities, they haven't had access to um, all kinds of things that are otherwise what they pay for in their rent, what they pay for in their rent. And on top of not having that kind of access, the landlord has been increasing their rents higher than any other rent-controlled building in the city. So of course, that adds insult to injury, rents are going up higher than any other rent-controlled building, more above guideline rent increases than any other rent-controlled building. Um, Do you worry you're going to be thrown out? Plenty of tenants at 33 King Street worry about being thrown out. Because I'd like to also paint a picture of what is, what, what is 33 King Street. It's very representative, actually, of the vast majority of tenants who are living in the city under a corporate landlord. And that is... They are the working class. They are seniors on fixed incomes that have been working their whole lives. Mm -hmm. They have been working their whole lives. And they say, if we don't win this, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know where I'm going to go. You want it on this, Kayla? Yeah. Like, if you look at it, like, you, 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 you say that the tenants don't have access to their, their balconies, and which there's a process in that. The tenants can file at the landlord and tenant board to get a rebatement back on their rent because they weren't able to use a facility at that building. Mm -hmm. But the yeah. problem is the landlord and tenant board has collapsed. It's not providing justice to tenants, and it's not providing it to landlords. We did a show on that and recently. That's, mm -hmm. And this is where you get into what is the number one backlog at the landlord and tenant board? Non-payment of rent. Our government put six $6.5 million into the landlord and tenant board to hire adjudicators at $110,000 a piece to deal with people with no money. Now, wouldn't you like to go to the government and say, instead of saying, hey, big corporate landlord who is providing housing stock, how about we take that money and you can talk to the elected officials to say, can I have a portable housing benefit? Something to help me keep up with these increases. What's a portable housing benefit? It's a, it's a program that the government has issued out where a, a maximum you can get about $350 additional per month to keep people from applying to government housing. The government housing, there's a wait list for 12 years in Cambridge, Ontario and the Waterloo region, 22 years in Mississauga. We have a difference between are you affordable housing and sustainable sustainable private housing and we have to look at the difference between that but you could be asking the government for that because you I, know the tenant union the building, is not interested you need the building to main, be maintained because if not the city is going to find the landlord or they're going to come in and do it and put it to their property taxes okay. so you have Let's multiple to ways respond. to do it the tenant union is not interested in asking the government to subsidize a corporation that is making 50 percent profit off of rental income it's just not, it's just not. That's not our Would ask. Would a shelter allowance our, not be helpful to you? Our ask, the, the asks of the rent strike, the rent strike demands are specifically about above guideline rent increases. It's about this tactic that is being used excessively to get around rent control. The first one, the first demand of the rent strike is to drop the existing above guideline rent increases. The second is to commit to no more above guideline rent increases, again, 33 King Street is the building with the highest number of above guideline rent increases, even during the rent freeze. Even during the rent freeze, when the Premier said there should be no more rent increases because of this pandemic, Dream Unlimited increased rents for their tenants 3%. And then the last, the last demand of the rent strike is about a rent abatement. It absolutely is. Because insult to injury, tenants are being asked to pay more for less. They haven't had access to a part of their unit for over a year. They haven't had access to common amenities. Okay, we understand and this. And just recently, 
The landlord is now asking tenants to vacate the unit for three full days in order to, for them to continue to do the repairs. And I'd like to respond to something that Dream said in their statement about a previous negotiated settlement, because it is important for the tenant association to note that in that previous negotiated set settlement last year, tenants have tried everything. They have tried going to the landlord and tenant board. They have tried marching and protesting. They have tried calling their landlord. They have tried setting up meetings. And in fact, last year, under a previous above guideline rent increase, actually sat down and negotiated that above guideline rent increase and actually did, actually did, under a no negotiated settlement, have that above guideline rent increase reduced by 3% which was a huge victory for tenants. It meant that everybody that was paying the full above guideline rent increase should have had a payment made to them by the landlord of 3%. Did that happen? No. And the reason why nobody received any of the money that they were promised in the settlement is because Dream Unlimited turned around and said, we have all of these other above guideline rent increases that we expect are gonna get approved, so we don't owe you any money. Hmm. Can I understand how many rent uh, strikes are currently taking place in Ontario? There's at least one other ten uh, rent strike right now. It's on Thorncliffe Park Drive. In Toronto? In Toronto. Uh, there are three buildings there. There are on rent strikes since May 1st. Uh, their landlord is Starlight that holds some assets on behalf of PSP, the pension fund for federal public servants. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened there was similar to what Kiara said. Uh, they, apl they applied for an AGI that would increase rent over two years by 10%. These are low to moderate income working families. They said, that's too much. We can't. We can, we can bear that. Uh, after three years of a pandemic, after a year where food prices are going up by more than 10%, they tried to negotiate. The landlord did not want to negotiate. They tried again. Nothing and then they went on a rent strike. Right, me... But if I may, I find it important to sometimes take a step back a little bit. And we're not talking about just individual landlords and individual tenants, but there's a question here of political rights that I think that's important. Labor, organized labor, they have the right to collective bargaining and they can make their concerns and demands through that channel. Obviously it is the responsibility of the provincial government to kind of try to find the sweet spot between landlords and tenants so that we have a good system going forward. Varun, how well do you think the current government of Ontario has done at finding that sweet spot? They're doing a horrible job. They failed. They failed landlords and they failed tenants. They have failed to uh, properly address the maintenance issues in these aging buildings, right? You funded the, these, pro you encouraged developers to build these purpose-built rentals in the 60s, and now you provide no assistance to keep it maintained and up-to-date. There isn't any new buildings. Toronto Community Housing is crumbling. It's, the, the awful, awful buildings infested with cockroaches, mice, mold, mildew, guns and gangs. It's, and why? It's because there's no money to maintain these buildings. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's the uh, Landlord and Tenant Board, which is backlogged, as Kayla said, with L1 applications. And instead, the tenant union groups are encouraging tenants so let's back it up even more by encouraging landlords to file even more L1 applications. Kayla, I want to ask you, how concerned are you that we have two rent strikes right now in the city of Toronto, that there could be more? You know, I'm concerned for the tenants. I'm concerned, yes. and not for so much, like the landlords are getting out of the business now. The small landlords, they're getting into Portugal, they're getting into Belize, Costa Rica, Mexico, you name it, they're pulling out because of how broken the system actually is. To have Steve Clark to be a minister of housing and municipal affairs, we need a, a minister of just municipal affairs because what we're talking about right now is an above the guideline rent increase, thinking that it's so easy for an owner to get above the guideline rent increase. And I'll give you an example that a friend of ours has a $1.2 million property of value, because obviously your value means nothing unless you're selling it these days, and that was $200,000 in renovations. They waited two years, paid $200 to file for an application and they got the total of 7.6 over three years or sorry 7.1 over three years 7.1 over three years yeah so maximum is nine they got 7.1 and that's and it's not very easy they're asking for information they're asking for receipts you have to have a copy of those receipts given to the tenants we have to look at we have a housing crisis does the government want to listen to the people who are building and managing these type of properties or do they want to listen to people who are obviously making it worse I got we have a housing seconds. affordability crisis yeah but everybody agrees on that 
uh, in our last 30 seconds here, what do you think it will take to get the rent strike to end? We want Dream to sit down at the table and actually negotiate and not do what they did last time they negotiated with the tenants, which was fall, like totally fall through the agreement that they settled on. We want, we want Dream to sit down with the tenant association, negotiate on those three demands, no more above guideline rent increases, dropping the previous AGIs, and rent abatements for loss of service. And that's what it will take for when the tenants associations decide to stop paying, stop the rent strike, everyone pays the rent. Everyone pays the rent. This isn't about free rent and it's not about handouts. It's about fairness. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, that was intense. But, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, a good discussion, which needs to be had. Varun Sraskanda and Kayla Andrade on the right-hand side of the table from Solo, the Small Ownership Landlords of Ontario and Ontario Landlords Watch, respectively. And on the other side of the table, Ricardo Trenjan. Uh, he's got a book called The Tenant Class. And Chiara Padovani, York Southwestern Tenant Union involved in the rent strike at 33 King in the northwest part of the city. We should just let everybody know. That's not the King Street that's downtown where all the fancy buildings are. This is in the northwest part of the city, a, a very different part of Toronto. Yes. Good. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.